Welcome to Couple Reviews, where we're very, very happy today because Stargirl Season 3 is upon us. I'm doing something a little bit different today. Uh, I was going to do a video about the first two seasons of Stargirl and then do episode by episode reviews of Stargirl Season 3, but then I decided just to talk about the first two seasons in the same videos as the Season 3 analysis. Basically, it's about this teenage girl whose stepdad used to be a superhero sidekick. They moved to Blue Valley where there turns out to be a bunch of supervillains who killed off the, the earlier team of superheroes. So then Courtney finds this staff that used to belong to a superhero named Starman, who her stepdad was a sidekick to, and she uses that to be a superhero and she gets these other teenagers to join her team of superheroes to fight the bad guys. You might be wondering, why this show? Why do episode-by-episode episode videos of Stargirl when I haven't done that for any other show yet? When I first watched season one of Stargirl, I thought that it was good, with a few rough, pokey moments here and there. When I got to the last episode, they revealed that the bad guys were basically the Thought Police, which I thought it was so cool that in this day and age they had the Thought Police be the bad guys. Basically they had this machine to rewire people's brains to think correctly and if it didn't work on them they would die and that would have meant like thousands of people would have been killed if, for not thinking correctly. So I thought this show, I will fight for this show, I love this show and then season 2 came out. And it was so much better than the first season, and I've just gotten really attached to these characters, some of them anyway, and I think Stargirl is the best show on CW, I know there's not much competition for that. So everybody leave your depression at the door, because we have an episode of Stargirl to watch. Obviously in a video about the romance in Stargirl, you want me to, you probably if you're familiar with the show, you probably want me to jump straight to Courtney and Cameron. We'll get to them. We'll get to them. But I want to talk about the parents first. I thought that they did a really uncliched job of Courtney's mom not knowing at first, but then finding out in a, in a timely manner and, and reacting to it the way that she should have at, from, a, from a writing perspective. I mean, normally in a show where they keep it a secret from the parents, that the teenager is a superhero, you expect that to go on for the whole show or at least the first five seasons. But in Stargirl, they had her find out relatively soon, and then she, the way she reacted was she was freaking out at first because, like, that was, which, which was a realistic reaction, but then she came around, like, I think she was just realizing she was acting irrational to freak out like that. I like how Pat wanted to tell her tr the truth almost immediately, but, but Courtney kept saying if you tell her she's gonna ruin everything and shut everything down, we can't do this, we have to keep it a secret from her. So Pat felt like he had to keep it a secret from his wife that they were doing the superhero stuff or else the world would end, potentially. We need to be honest. I know. I'm really sorry. I mean with, I mean with your mother. If we tell her right now, she won't let us do this anymore. And flags on the world. That's... I'm not totally sold on Sir, on Cindy Berman being on the good guys team yet. I She did a few things in season one that I... I mm, it's, gonna, it's gonna take work for them to get, to get me to like her. If you don't remember, in the first se uh, what? <sighs> who, who was asking for the gambler to come back for season three? I, he's never the best villain. Alright, let's talk about the title here for a second. The subtitle of the season is Frenemies, with a dumb word for a wonderful writing tradition. In season two, set up a lot of characters to have complicated relationships with each other. Cindy has a very unpleasant history with the main cast, but she also helped them to beat Eclipso. Shade is kind of on the good guy's side, but at the same time he's 
proven that he's not exactly trustworthy all the time. We'll, we'll talk more in depth about what's going on with Cameron later and it seemed like Starman is probably going to be an antagonist because he doesn't like how they're getting all chummy with the reformed villains. But even at the end of the second season, they sort of teased the idea of Starman having guidance that conflicts with Pat's, so he's going to be at odds with him in terms of training Courtney. So there's a lot of, a lot of complicated relationships, which I like. I don't... I might not have picked this subtitle, but that's fine. This show has always been a little bit hokey, which you do. It's the, so there's some stuff to just forgive and, and move past, but it's been worth it so far. Oh, please tell Barbara we have got to get together for coffee. I will. She'll be thrilled. She won't. They didn't explain it yet. Those two were in prison. Uh, well, they had prison sentences last time we checked, hey. but then they just showed up. Maybe they, maybe they got some sort of deal to get them out of jail. They didn't say what happened yet. Fox, you kidding me? They're not our enemies anymore. We can help the bad guys break good. <laughs> and besides that, if the Crocs wanted to kill you, that lock wouldn't stop them. While you were on the run, Everyone else helped us save Blue Valley. Yeah, I heard all about that devilish business with the Black Diamond and Eclipso. My own father abandoned me. I want my daughter to go through life thinking I abandoned her. His story sounded fake until he brought up his own dad. I'm not sure if that was what they were going for. So let's talk a bit about Courtney and Cameron. The way they first met was, was them doing nice things for other people where Courtney, uh, jo where Joey was doing a magic trick where he had Courtney pick a card and put it back in the deck and then he showed her a card and asked, is this your card? And Courtney was, uh, knew it wasn't her card, but she said it was to make him look good and make him feel better. And Cameron knew what she did. <laughs> Then we found out that Cindy wrote uh, the word slut on Yolanda's locker and Cameron painted over it and then and then Courtney saw it and drawing and figured out she was the one who did it so she so she started talking to him because she thought that was a nice thing of him to do. You were the one that painted Yolanda's locker. Proper right. Maybe. Which that was a perfect way for them to break the ice because Cameron is not very talkative and he, does, he has issues with approaching people. You might have noticed in the first two seasons, Cameron doesn't have any friends. He wasn't like he was going to just walk up to court and introduce himself. He formed actions which got her attention. He's a good person, he just doesn't know how to talk to people. So even when she asked him if he drew if he painted over that writing, he was like, maybe I did it. Hey, morning, bud. Crusher, it's 5.30 in the morning. What are you doing in my kitchen? Did he break the lock to get... The gambler. Let me tell you something. That Kentucky fried felon is not to be trusted. You should talk. That's you killed multiple coaches because First you didn't like how they were coaching your daughter. Yeah. You killed one of your teammates yeah. because he was Almost talking killed you. crap about your daughter. But I do appreciate the effort. I'm trying to think if the shade got hit with any of the, the Green Lantern energy in the first, in, in that second season. I don't think he did. The green sparks may, automatically made my mind go to Green Lantern, but I don't know what the connection is there. Especially Cindy. She stabbed me in the back and she'll do it to you too, first chance she gets. If you don't remember what happens, in uh, season one with Yolanda and Cindy. Uh, Cindy, okay, uh, just, Yolanda, yeah. well, wait, 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 wait. <sighs> okay, this has been waiting long enough, so I'm gonna talk about Cindy and Yolanda first, then we'll get to this, this thing. Yolanda sent her, at the time, boyfriend, Henry, a uh, topless photo of her, and then Cindy leaked 
I grabbed his phone and leaked it all over the school. So she's been getting slut shamed and uh, ostracized by her family ever since then, except for her brother. Having Cindy be reformed is something that I am going to struggle to accept. And there's also what she did to her stepmom. Her stepmom was had been brainwashed to do whatever she says and what her dad says, and she was abusing that, and she eventually got her stepmom killed by Eclipso. So I, just when her stepmom thought she was free, and then they tried to make us sympathize with Cindy by telling her tragic backstory, which I, which did not work on me. I remember that part where uh, Cindy was sinking into Eclipso's black sludge and it looked like she was dying. I was so happy until I found out that she's not dead. Okay, just, I was thinking so that this show's costumes are a mixed bag because Courtney's suit looks perfect. Meanwhile, Our Man and Dr. Midnight look ridiculous. They look like high school play costumes or Halloween costumes. Technically, it makes sense because they are just kids who had to make their costumes. But still, they I need something that looks better. I, I can't take them seriously in those costumes, especially Dr. Midnight. So th they're talking about a new costume phone. that I'm, I'm listening. Ear However, phone. it doesn't look like they got her measurements right. Go. With Beth's parents, they almost got a divorce in the second season, but they I'm glad they didn't. So normally, when you see divorces in TV shows, just something that's treated as uncontrollable, like, what are you gonna do about it? People's parents get divorced, it happens. With what they said was having a superhero for a daughter in their life in their life threatening experience just reinvigorated them or something. I guess that sends a good message of they're being ridiculous to think they need a divorce when all they, all they need would just in was to inject more incite excitement into an otherwise stale relationship. So it's treating their impulse to get a divorce as irrational, which I like. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> I guess me sitting here means this isn't the loser's table anymore. <laughs> she... You called them the losers after they beat the crap out of you and your team twice. Um. So I want to start this team meeting by talking about teamwork. Did she invite her? First, we have to wipe the slate clean. All of us. If I can look beyond the past with Cindy, so can all of you. Not necessarily. Courtney. I feel like that's not... That's not Courtney's decision to make. It, Courtney... I, I understand that Courtney got hospitalized by Cindy that one time, but Yolanda continues to have problems with her parents and presumably other people talking about her, like she's a slut, presumably, to this day. I I think Courtney should have left this decision to Yolanda. No, Court. You and Beth agreed to invite her into the JSA. Yolanda and I, we voted no. Okay, at first I was thinking, Rick's saying that as if she hurt him specifically more than Courtney. Uh, I don't remember Cindy doing something sp to specifically Rick. But then I thought, okay, it's not about what Cindy did to Rick. Rick is just sticking up for Yolanda and he's being more supportive of his friend's feelings. So he's... So that was Rick saying she hurt Yolanda, and Yolanda's not okay with this, so I'm not okay with this. So going back to Courtney and Cameron, they're both clearly into each other. Cameron worked up the courage to ask Courtney to the dance. He was, he was pretty awkward about it because he doesn't know how to be smooth, he doesn't have experience at asking girls out or, or talking to people in general. Because again, he has no friends. Courtney? Hey. <laughs> I was hoping you'd be here. Do you mind if I sit down? Please, yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you want to go to the homecoming dance with me? And then, just Cameron's luck, she ends up getting hospitalized, so she can't go to the dance. And then they had that sit-down dinner with Courtney's family and Cameron's family, and Courtney found out that Cameron's dad is Icicle, leader of the Injustice Society. If 
Jordan is one of them, does that mean Cameron is too? Like Cindy? I don't know. Hopefully we can uh, do something soon. Uh, sure. Okay. And then that was the last we saw of Cameron for that entire season. It's a running theme that Cameron gets the short end of the stick. Courtney keeps giving him signals that she's interested in him, but then she keeps not get coming through for him because of all this stuff going on. Which, she's not lying to him about being interested, at least not at first, because when she found out his dad was a supervillain, she... It was unclear if she was... if she was... If she completely lost interest, or if she was just being cautious from that point forward. I realize Artemis has a history with Courtney and her friends, like us. She desperately wants to join the Justice Society of America. I just hope Courtney doesn't hold grudges, because that'd be a real shame. Well, who's in the JSA isn't up to me. It's up to them. <laughs> Great response there. Oh, you know, that's just, that's, that's above my pay grade. You know? You're gonna have to talk to my manager about that. <laughs> Okay, he's alone now, so so he is looking for someone named Rebecca, but he could st no. I want to say that he could still be lying about why he wants to find her, but his picture on the lamp suggests he actually is actually doing this out of love. What's that gun for? That looked like a single shot gun, a single bullet gun. I mean, so is he planning on killing himself if this doesn't work? At the end of season one. Cameron's dad ended up getting killed by accident, and Courtney never told him about that, and he, Cameron never knew that his dad was Icicle, so he has no idea about how he died. So in season two, Cameron is mourning his, his the loss of his dad, having no idea that his dad was a murderer, or that he was trying to take over a chunk of the country. You're in trouble asking Mama. Well, I had competition. There was another man pursuing her. So what did you do? I killed him. And, Kent and Courtney is like coming in to say hello and make sure he's okay, which I'm not sure. I think at the beginning of season two, it's not really clear if Courtney is still interested in Cameron, but he's definitely still interested in her. And he got her to be interested in him again uh, by showing her his. I mean, I'm not sure if she was still interested or if he got her interested in again. Uh, he showed Courtney pictures of her that he'd been drawing. I wanted to show you something, but it's it's kind of weird. It's me. And she thought that was really sweet, so that it could have been that she fell out of interest and then and got interested in him again when seeing the pictures. But still, she keeps running off to do Stargirl stuff, so Cameron is getting upset that, that she keeps running out on him and not being there for him, and she can't tell him why that is. But she keeps saying, yes, I'm interested, but also I can't, I'm too busy, which that, that's driving him crazy, and he doesn't, he doesn't know if she's actually into him or not, or if she's just pretending to be interested in him. And he doesn't know if he's doing something to put her off because he's not he doesn't have much social interaction, so he doesn't have a frame of reference for how to interact with people. I have to go. I'm so sorry. The drawing weirded you out, didn't it? No, not at all. You can sketch me as many times as you want. <laughs> Courtney keeps saying that no, she likes she likes what he's doing, but it doesn't feel that way for him because she, she keeps not being there for him. I really have to go. You did this to me last year, Courtney. You always leave or never show. Last time. I promise. I thought that Courtney was kind of being a hypocrite in season two because she got upset that her parents didn't tell her about the, the time the JSA killed someone. But she's been keeping the secret from Cameron this whole time about how his dad died, about who's, who his dad was and how his dad died. And I like how at the end of season two, they set up that Courtney ran out of time to tell Cameron the truth because his creepy parent, his creepy grandparents are gonna tell him everything and they're probably gonna tell him that Courtney killed his dad, which now Cameron, he doesn't know Courtney well enough to take her word over his grandparents' word because she never 
gave him enough of her time. When I came back to life, which... <laughs> in case... I realized. If you haven't seen Stargirl, you might be watching this thinking, who's Cameron? I don't see him anywhere. Cameron has not shown up in this episode. Uh, not yet, anyway. No. Because you're the future. Not me. I usually hate legacy superheroes who take over the title from a previous superhero. And yet, I like Stargirl, who who does pretty much the same thing. The thing is with, let's say, Peter Parker as Spider-Man, I don't want Miles Morales to replace Peter Parker because I like Peter Parker, and because Peter Parker is a great character who everyone loves. The thing is, there aren't really fans of the original Starman or the previous Starman, I think, or the Star Spangled Kid is what he might be called comic books originally, so it's not like you're replacing a character who everyone loved and was always well written. The criminals that hijacked the truck tonight are called the No Limit Gang. They used to work for the Gambler back in the day. Come on, you think this is all just some coincidence? The Gambler shows up in Blue Valley and his gang a few miles outside of it. It's too obvious. He would have told them to wear different masks. I like how Cameron was upset with Courtney for, for blowing him off all the time, but then that ended when he saw her interact with her dad and how he was pulling her away from Cameron to do stuff, which that sent him the message that, okay, Courtney does actually want to be around him. It's just that she has these obligations that her dad's enforcing that she can't actually get out of. You know, Court, we should really get going because your mom had that thing planned. See ya. Court, we should go. We'll talk later. I'll find you, okay? Then he, after that, he was more understanding. When Courtney got a text, he was he was telling her that if she wants, uh, if she needs to go do something else, she can. Sorry. It's fine. Courtney, if you have to go, it's it's fine. No. I'm exactly where I need to be right now. Why are you giving someone like the Gambler a chance? He's trying to be better for his daughter. Gambler is a better dad than mine ever was. She's talking about her biological dad, not Pat. I'm surprised she didn't bring up that when she first met Yolanda and Rick, they were kind of cold and they were not very good when she first met them. Like Rick was, he was stealing stuff and he was selling kegs of alcohol to teenage parties. He got redemption, and Yolanda, she didn't really, she wasn't at that level, but she was kind of a jerk at the beginning of, of the show. She, she could have brought that up, but she didn't. Uh, you realize this looks bad, right? I didn't do it. I don't want to, but I believe her. She she wouldn't have been able to make that huge hole in his trailer. Also, the the show is trying to push her redemption arc, so she's not going to be guilty of this no matter how bad it looks. You know from the last scene of season two that there's going to be another villain. I'm glad it's not just going to be a whole season of heroes and former villains not sure if they should trust each other for this whole time. So there's another threat on top of that. Without that extra villain, it would have just been like an aftermath story where all the big stuff is already behind us. And we're just dealing with the dust settling. I'm glad there's another villain on top. So with the new villain coming in, the stakes will be upped because how can we deal with this other villain when we can when we can barely even keep peace with each other? They surprised me with how well they could anticipate the audience's reaction to the gambler. Yeah, I was thinking that I didn't want to spend that much time with the gambler. It turn, turns out they knew that because they killed him off in the first episode of the season. And yet they did that in such a way where... Um, it sort of reminds me of what they did with Eclipso a few times. They had these characters show up that they got you to get invested in their... Uh, in their happiness, and then they had Eclipso kill them off, so you're angry at Eclipso. So it seems like that was what they're trying to 
do with uh, the gambler in this episode. They knew that we wouldn't want to spend an entire season with his subplot, so they just had him do this one episode to set up other stuff and and have Cindy be there to possibly take the blame, depending on whether or not they believe her when she said she didn't do it. Obviously a big theme in that episode was can we trust these former villains, which you even have other villains not trusting other former villains. And Pat was saying that the gambler doesn't have the same slack because he didn't help them with Eclipso. The thing is he wasn't asked to, act to help with Eclipso. He didn't have the opportunity to help them out. So it's kind of unfair that the others are, are trusted because they had the opportunity to prove that they were trustworthy while the gambler didn't have that opportunity. And now he's dead, so he'll never have that opportunity. And by the way, if you don't get how the Crocs are out of prison. I don't get it either. I Last time I checked, they had prison sentences and they said they would break back into prison. Are they just in hiding or no? The police know what they look like, so they'd be able to find them. Maybe they'll explain it later, I don't know. Oh, and, and as for Sylvester coming back to life, I... That story about... His theory about Courtney grabbing the staff, bringing him back to life, I really hope that that gobbledygook is not true. I really hope that that's not true. I mean, once you do that, you just tell the audience that if a character dies, we'll just make up whatever nonsense we want to bring them back. I'm really hoping that either A, Sylvester faked his death and he's been lying about it this whole time, or B, he's actually a clone and he doesn't know it yet. Either of those would be acceptable, but but if he actually came back to life because its staff chose a new holder, I'm, that's not good. Obviously Cameron didn't show up for this entire episode. I think the lack of screen time that Cameron gets is just symbolic of what his character is going through. That's Cameron's lot in life that even the show itself treats him like an afterthought. He's neglected by everyone, including the cameramen. I have more to say about Courtney and Cameron, but I think I'll save that for the next episode. Hopefully that'll be an episode that Cameron is actually in. I know that he's going to be in this season, at least. Uh, he was in the trailer for season three, so you know that he's going to, they're going to do more with him and, and Courtney. So again, I don't know how this is going to go. I might, I might edit this and decide that it shouldn't be its own video and then maybe I'll combine it with other episode reactions. I don't know, but may, maybe I'll do this as its own episode and then do another episode for, se for episode two. I don't know, maybe this video won't get that many views and then I won't want to do a, a video for each episode, so we'll just... I'm not guaranteeing another video about episode two, let's just... we'll see how it goes, I guess. I'm Courtney. Cameron, I first saw your mother in Trafalgar Square in London. When I finally got up the courage to speak with her, she showed me page after page of the most amazing drawings she'd made. Me. It looks a lot like Courtney Whitmore to me. You found your muse. Every great artist has one. Back when I was doing the best work of my life, I did. Your art can say everything you can. Show her. I wanted to show you something. It's me. <laughs> yeah. The drawing weirded you out, didn't it? No, not at all. <laughs> you can sketch me as many times as you want. <laughs> so many people have told me how much my dad has changed their lives. You know, an artist feels kind of selfish. Denying the world of your talent could seem selfish, too. So remember to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, and hate Cindy.